This is exercise 34, and this is an interesting dysrhythmia that's not covered in um, earlier on in the book. This is something called a torsade de pointe, which is French for twisting of the points. And let's start with the heart rate first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how torsades happen and under what circumstances we may see it. So beginning with a heart rate, typically between 150 and 250. And this is important because um, Sometimes you'll see a ventricular fibrillation that looks similar to this in the sense that you see QRSs that get larger and they get smaller and it may appear to be a torsade, but the QRSs are far too close together to actually be a torsade. So if we look at uh, the QRS complexes, for example, and find one that falls on a dark line, uh, the next one is greater than 5 millimeters away. So if you saw a rhythm in which the QRS complexes were fewer than 5 millimeters apart, you're probably looking at a ventricular fibrillation rather than a torsade de point. And I've made that mistake in the past. So the P waves, um, this is an absolutely chaotic rhythm and the P waves will be absent. And because the P waves are absent, the PR interval is not applicable. The QRS is wide and the QRS deflection varies. The ratio obviously is not applicable because we don't have P waves. And the rhythm is irregularly irregular and it tends to happen in paroxysms, paroxysms rather. So the uh, patients may experience paroxysmal bouts of torsade de point that may last, you know, 15, 20 seconds in length and they may have some uh, seemingly benign signs and symptoms, or they may have a sustained torsade de point. And if they're in a sustained torsade de point, again, keep in mind, this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And if they're sustained, they may be vital signs absent. They may be apneic, unresponsive, uh, and pulseless. And in which case we treat that cardiac arrest, just like any ventricular fibrillation or pulses VT arrest with defibrillation. Now, the one caveat to keep in mind is if they are in cardiac arrest with a torsade de point and you, and you strongly suspect a torsade de point, one of the treatments of choice is magnesium sulfate given uh, intravenously. And if you work with a paramedic service that doesn't, doesn't carry mag sulfate, consider transporting this patient sooner rather than later to the hospital so they can be treated with mag sulfate. So the interpretation is a torsade de point. That's how you spell it there. Now, the most common cause of torsade de point is a long QT. So QT interval greater than normal. So let's just go over a QT interval again. Now, the quick way to eyeball a QT to determine whether it's prolonged or normal is to look at the r to r interval and is the QT greater than half of the R to R interval. So there's the R to R, there's a halfway mark, and you can see here that the, the QT interval runs from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave, and in this case, the QT interval is shorter than half of the R to R interval. That's normal. In a, in a case of prolonged QT, what we see is that the QT interval is greater than half of the R to R interval. So here's the, the onset of the QRS, Here's the end of the T wave, and you can see that it ends later than the halfway mark between the two R waves. Now, one of the ways you can eyeball this quickly, I mean, typically you, you can look at an ECG and just get an idea that the QT interval is prolonged, then you can actually measure it. Um, and I strongly recommend all my students that they look at the Q, eyeball the QT interval uh, on every single ECG strip that they see, but especially patients they feel who are maybe at high risk. And uh, one of the things you can do is you can take an ECG strip and hold it up to the light and then fold it over so that two adjoining R waves, two, two R waves are side by side, are on top of one another. And then when you open up that ECG, uh, the fold will be the halfway mark between the two R waves. And if the T wave ends before the fold, you've got a normal QT interval. If it ends beyond the fold, then you've got a prolonged QT. And um, now one of the ways to measure that on a 12 lead ECG is, um, uh, or to measure it manually, is if the QT is greater than 600 milliseconds, those patients are predisposed to torsade. Um, now, we, we get worried when the QT is greater than 500 milliseconds, but if it's greater than 600 milliseconds, they're at high risk of torsade to point. And keep in mind that uh, one millimeter is equal to 40 milliseconds, five millimeters is equal to 200 milliseconds. The QTC interval, uh, if it's greater than 450 milliseconds, that's uh, a risk of torsade.
and 12 ADCDs, most transport monitors will interpret the QTC for you, which is great. You, so you don't have to go through that complex mathematical formula. And so if it's if you measure it manually, it's greater than 600. If you measure the QTC or look at the QTC, it's greater than 450. Then those patients are predisposed to TORSAT. Now, let's go back to the previous slide. And I want to talk about a couple of caveats here. So, um, again, this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia in which the heart rate is typically between 100 and 250. There are gradual changes in the QRS amplitude, and there's twisting of the QRS. It may be upgoing, then it's downgoing. Um, we may see a, uh, a, a sustained torso at the point, in which case they're often in cardiac arrest, uh, but it can happen in short bouts as well, and it may end spontaneously. And what I find particularly interesting about torsat is it's really kind of the only cardiac arrest rhythm in which they, they become vital signs absent, and as you're preparing the defibrillation pads, um, they spontaneously convert into a sinus rhythm, and they're awake, and they're perfusing again, and you wonder, you know, what what just happened. Uh, so if, if that ever happens to you, that's probably a, a torsad to point. Now, torsad accounts for fewer than 5% of sudden cardiac deaths. And to me, if, if it's under 5% of sudden cardiac deaths, that's to me still the significant number. And you'll see torsad in, in almost any age category. You can see it from the newborn to the elderly, but it most commonly occurs in adults between the ages of 35 and 50 years of age. And um, there's sort of two broad categories of prolonged QT, which is the uh, the leading cause of torsad, and one is a congenital prolonged QT, and the other is acquired prolonged QT. And um, if you see torsad in a young person, it's most likely uh, congenital, so uh, congenital long QT syndrome. If you see it in someone that's older, it's most likely acquired. And I'll talk about um, causes of acquired QT. So. Um, some people are born with it, as I mentioned. Some people may have it acquired, and typically that's the result of electrolyte imbalances, such as hypokalemia, which is low serum potassium, hypomagnesemia, which is low serum magnesium, or hypocalcemia, which is low serum calcium. Uh, certain drugs prolong the QT, including um, antibiotics, such as erythromycin. Certain antiarrhythmics may prolong the QT, such as class 1A, class 1C, and class 3 antiarrhythmics, so amyo Odorone would be in that category. Procainamide would be in that category as an example. And if patients are having paroxysmal bouts of torsad, typically uh, the, the signs and symptoms they will describe to you will be things such as they experienced palpitations, they experienced uh, dizziness or lightheadedness, maybe they had a, a brief bout of shortness of breath, maybe they broke out in a sweat, they may have, a, have had a syncope episode or a presyncope. And um, uh, it's important that when you're dealing with someone who appears to be asymptomatic, but it has had a recent history of palpitations or syncope or near syncope, that we take those seriously and consider torsad in our differential diagnosis, particularly if they're red flag syncopes like uh, children and adults over the age of 45, exertional syncope, um, if they've had previous bouts of syncope or if anyone in the family has had bouts of syncope or they tell you that someone else in the family had a, a died at an early age, all of those things uh, would make you worried that they've got a QT interval issue uh, and uh, prolonged QT and they're predisposed to torsad because they may have had a bout of torsad and you may never see it between the time you contact the patient and the time you drop them off at the hospital. One of the other uh, uh, syndromes that may lead to torsad to point is something called Brugada's syndrome. And if you're not familiar with Brugada, what I recommend is doing a Google search for the term. Um, look for a cardiologist by the name of Emil Matu, who gives a fantastic um, screencast on Brugada's syndrome. So always have a high index of suspicion when you're dealing with those patients who tell you they've had palpitations or dizziness or sudden onset of shortness of breath, and now they're feeling fine, or they've had syncope or near syncope.